we're talking about Mark Driscoll getting kicked off the stage. There's huge implications for the body of Christ. And I want to make sure that we talk about this. My friend Jeremiah Johnson is going to be joining me. And he's a prophetic voice in the earth right now. He's got some insights that are actually going viral already. But before we move forward, uh, let me hear your thoughts in the comment section concerning this situation. For those of you who don't know, the 30-second recap to get us all on the same page is uh, Pastor Mark Driscoll was on stage at James River Church and uh, the, the basically the at a men's conference. And this men's conference actually had an opener, which is very common for any large-scale conference. And I'm not hating on those openers, by the way. Uh, you know what I mean? Churches do things like that. Uh, sometimes they're even, um, I believe, ideas from heaven prophetically. You know, I've seen all kinds of expression of art that are more than appropriate. But what happened in this particular instance is that a, uh, an, a, a male dancer who also has a questionable past doing like different forms of stripping actually ascended on a pole and started strip, you know, basically before he ascended on the pole strip, he stripped off uh, his shirt and then got to the top of the pole and swallowed his sword. Mark Driscoll, on the other hand, who is a speaker, speaker at the event, who, you know, understands spiritual discernment, got up for his particular session and he said, hey, we need to be aware of the spiritual implications of these things. Jezebel's already been at this event. And then he talked about, you know, Ashtara and, um, you know, how these are these ancient deity gods that we know are demons that were worshipped by pagans. And, um, you know, you have the, the indication of a pole, a climbing pole, and begins to break down spiritually what happens. And, and he's now Mark Driscoll's on one knee while this is happening. And he's basically delivering this rebuke on a knee, I, I think, in a way to like demonstrate humility in this. And then while that happens, uh, the lead pastor ends up running, you know, basically running down towards the stage and said, you know, that you're out of line, Mark. And at, at which point Mark Driscoll went back to the podium and, you know, closed his Bible and prepared to leave stage. And then there was a conversation after the point after the fact. And when this conversation, you know, after the fact ensued, it, you know, and there's a lot of debate right now about the nature of that conversation, but what the attempt of behind it, and as somebody who's friends with Mark Driscoll, you know, I can tell you, um, I believe both the rebuke was done with a pure heart, but then also the session that followed was done with a pure heart. I believe it was an attempt to model reconciliation. It, it, you know, somebody's put in the comment section now, and I completely agree. It was a public display with a public rebuke. It was very simple. You know, I don't personally believe that Matthew 18 applies to every situation where there's division in the local church or there's differing opinions. In other words, when you look at um, Mark chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 18 in context, it's really talking about divisions um, in a local church setting amongst congregants that then gets elevated up to church leadership, depending on whether that's necessary. But you do also see apostles like Paul utilizing scripture. I mean, I mean, you're, you're talking, he was writing epistles inspired under the Holy Spirit and calling out people by name because within the apostolic dimension, like you sometimes have to correct publicly what happens publicly. And so even for me, as the lead pastor of V1 Church, when it comes down to correcting things, I often have to ask myself, who knows about this? And because that's the group of people that I want to bring the correction to. I don't want to bring a realm of correction to the totality of all five locations of V1 Church, because if it, if it didn't affect all five locations, if it didn't happen all five, then you want to limit the amount um, of the, the, the public displays of rebuke that happened. And so, you know, so oftentimes we have to deal with things in varying sizes of people, groups of people within V1, depending on who um, was implicated and who things happen with. That's This is a, a healthy, um, biblically based version of Matthew chapter 18, but then also an understanding of the apostolic. So I say that because I think we've gotten to this point in the body of Christ, and we're, I'm going to be sharing more insights and uh, Prophet Jeremiah Johnson, he's an apostolic leader as well, is going to be joining. And we're going to talk about this um, 
But here's the thing. What, what it showed me is that we have, we have discernment ministries that really have no discernment. Uh, we have the call out culture or exposed culture that their heart's not right. They're doing it for views. They're growing YouTube channels. And many of those guys ironically don't have accountability, but they're an accountability ministry. But then on the other hand, we have people that on the other extreme end of the spectrum that they they don't ever see an appropriate time to say to speak out and to say things. Um, and And quite frankly, you know, you either have people with no influence at all um, trying to do things that would require a much greater level of apostolic influence, um, or you have people that don't understand when, when it's appropriate to speak into things. But I'm going to bring uh, Jeremiah in. We're going to talk about this a little bit deeper, and it's going to be a great conversation. Hey, while he's joining us, would you guys hit that share button, get this out to a few more people um, so that they can join us while we're still alive. Hey, thanks for being, being willing to jump on last minute. Hey, Mike, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, this is going to be a great conversation. So where I left off, and I'll just kick it right over to you, is, you know, I'm talking about the apostolic dimension. I felt like what Mark Driscoll did personally, from my my view of it, was something happened publicly. He was correcting it publicly. He was narrating it. Um, but I also think that there's a much bigger bigger implication for what we saw. And I think in the body of Christ, it's either been like smear campaigns You know, on one extreme where people, you know, we have discernment ministries that have no discernment, accountability ministries without accountability, you know, people trying to do things for views, virality, the exposed videos. But then on the other end of the spectrum, there's people who think that the only thing acceptable is complete and total silence publicly, and then privately you deal with the matter. And it's kind of a distortion of Matthew chapter 18. And I think, you know, if I'm not trying to speak on behalf of Mark Driscoll, but I think that what he was trying to do is saying, hey, you know, sometimes in the body of Christ, we do have to deal with things um, in this nature and exposing Jezebel. Sorry, I my teeth are in excruciating pain right now. I just got out of the dentist. But um, I think what he was trying to do um, was there, there is a pervasive spirit of Jezebel in operation in the body of Christ. And he was trying to expose it and and confront it. Um, and I, I really genuinely feel that he was attacking a principality and a power and a ruler in high places, not a person. And But it's also very unusual to see that in the body of Christ today because of both ends of those spectrum. It's either exposure done with the wrong heart or none at all. So I don't know what your thoughts are. I know you have a video that's actually trending right now on this topic, but um, me and you are joining forces because we felt... We both talked earlier today and felt like there's so much more to this. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a there's a whole other world in, involved in this, Mike. So I appreciate your perspective. I mean, let's just even look at it. I don't I've not even heard this this particular perspective, but let's put it in the context of like, you know, you and I are friends, Mike. We have history you know, you've spoken at our conferences, you know, I'm speaking at the breakers conference at the end of this year. I mean, I've spoken at conferences for you. I mean, some people are trying to judge and weigh this maybe from their own perspective and listen, Mark Driscoll and John Lindell have history. They have been friends for a long time. So I think sometimes like invoking the Matthew 18 thing, it, it it's out of touch yeah. with the history that they have together. So, you know, I, I just think like as a conference host, bro, if I invited you, Mike, to a conference that I was hosting, we've known each other for a long time. If you get up there at your session and you start rebuking a principality or something that I had let, like, I would be like, yes, Mike, I received that, brother. Right. Like, you, your, your invitation to the conference, like, supersedes Matthew 18. Like, Come on. by you speaking at the conference, yes. I'm giving you authority, like, I'm trusting you. I'm like, I'm giving you like, yeah, speak your peace. Yes. Deliver. I mean, when you watch the video, Mark gets up there. I'm hoarse. I've been up yeah. till 1 a.m. He clearly has a prophetic burden from the Lord. And again, yes. I'm not, I, I want to hear from people watching right now. I, I have not heard this perspective. We're just fighting about Matthew 18, but we're not talking about their 
prior relationship to the conference, which yep. would have granted a realm of liberty and yes. understanding and trust so that when something like this came out, I mean, Mike, I, I just I feel like part of even like what could have happened is if if the host pastor could have recognized, hey, I trust Mark. I know Mark. There's something that he's hearing from God. What if they had have allowed this to go yeah. forth? address he wasn't attacking this performer he wasn't even trying to my knowledge he wasn't even really rebuking his friend he was right. just saying hey there's a jezebel spirit in operation here let's confront it i just wonder what would have happened if we could have leaned into the relationship leaned into the authority that was given as a conference speaker and call for repentance i mean they're celebrating I think 500 people got saved at the conference. I'm like, what about two, 3,000 men on their face? Yes. As soon as he prophesies or abuses this, like, but again, I, I haven't heard anybody talk about this yet. I haven't either. And it's so crazy how much we're on the same page about this. I, you know, even people in my comment section now are saying, I'm so thankful that you're finally speaking out about it because I, I didn't give like an official you know, an opinion. I, I did a little, I worked it for my own marketing for a men's event yesterday. <laughs> I said, I said, Hey, I'm doing a men's event. There won't be a stripper pole, but if you want so, but, but I, but I do want to say this. I, I also think about alternative realities. So let's imagine this. Let's, let's flip it. Let's say that I come to your conference and there was an aspect that your team, you and your team planned that it seemed artistically viable. You knew what it meant, but then because I'm a, a deliverance guy, you know, demons are my forte. I've traveled all over the world, casting demons out like crazy. I've studied all this esoteric stuff historically, and I see something that maybe you guys didn't see. Knowing your heart and who you are, if I got up there and I did it in humility, like I felt like Mark did it, you know, I'm down on one knee, he's down on one knee. And I said, hey, you may not understand the implication of this, but when you did this, I believe that there were demons helping you guys puppeteer and mimic these actions because, you know, and, and so Mark, and I've got his book here. It's not like, you know, this isn't like a ploy to sell Mark's book, but like, I'm just saying to, to speak biblically right now, this guy wrote, he devoted an entire season of his life to, to studying these things. So he gets up there and he's, and, and I know Astra, I know the story behind the pole. She's a seductress. I, you know, when you see those things happen, um, modern days, like at strip clubs, these are just ancient spirits. There's patterns across Jonathan Kahn. He also wrote a book that talks about the patterns of the demonic. My point in saying it to those of you guys who are learning from this is the alternate, the alternate reality would have been him would would have been the lead pastor of this ministry running the state to the stage not to stop mark but to be like mark we hear you loud and clear once you're done with this moment this entire place is going to repent i'm closing the door to it and i mean that could have actually i got chills even saying it out loud oh, yeah. could have become the impetus for like a revival among men yeah. Yeah. And again, I think people are just looking at this like some random guy shows up to the conference, doesn't know the conference host. And even even when when Driscoll leaves and comes back out and has a conversation, the very first thing that they start talking about is how John Lindell was there for Mark in his previous season and on and on and on. But I think that there was enough relationship and friendship equity that we could have leaned into way beyond a Matthew 18. He didn't yes. even talk to him before. Like, again, I just think a lot of people's commentary is off base. I, I think there was a, a moment we missed but Mike, I even want to take it a step further. Yeah, go, let's go this, deeper. This, this is what I've been feeling prophetically. Like God, we were, we met, like th what happened at this conference was a snapshot into what God is. God is trying to broker a depth of relationship in the body of Christ that through relationship and through love, we can give one another a voice at the table on our platforms to speak truth in love. 
And yes. I, I just think we missed an opportunity to demonstrate to the Come body on. of Christ. Like, again, and again, we're not the Lone Ranger type. We're just not rebuking people or whatever. I'm just saying through love, through relationship, mm. we've got a model confronting principalities and powers, saying hard things, and then coming to an agreement and saying, you know what? I care about the truth more than my platform. I care about the truth more than the awkwardness. There there could have been a revival breakout yeah. in that moment that I just, I think they missed it. I agree with you. And you know, it's, you talk about relational equity. You know what it shows? There is, there is a concept that many people don't understand. They probably don't even know it exists biblically where it's a horizontal apostle. Like in other words, like we think so hierarchical in the body of Christ because we're very lead pastor centric. And I might be going too deep for some of you guys, but just hang with me. It's like here in America, even though the book of Ephesians says that Jesus Christ himself gave to us apostles, prophets, teachers, priests, and evangelists. We, How many of you guys even go to a church that where you could say that person's a prophet, that person's an apostle, that person's evangelist? So you, most of you don't. And, the, and so here's another problem. You go to a church where there's a pastor and that man functions in a realm of authority that is almost virtually unchecked the entire time. And the, the, and so I think what we're bringing to you guys is what it, what is the apostolic dimension? And I feel like Mark Driscoll came there as like an apostolic voice. The lead pastor functions sort of as an apostolic leader because they're a very significant ministry. They have a lot going on. And so I think there's this like lateral thing that's a horizontal thing. It's not hierarchical. It's more of like, but I think we're wise to listen to them. I want to tell a story real quick and then kick it back to you because I feel like I'm breaking something open for people because like right now, could it be that with the counterbalance to the heresy hunters on YouTube is not no accountability. It's accountability being provided from the right channels. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause like right now what we have is like the wild West and all these accountability channels on YouTube are like bandits they're like banditos, you know, it's like martial, yeah. it's like martial law up in these streets. So it's like the solution is not no accountability, but it's actually governmental accountability with real apostolic leadership. So real quick, like 30 second story. Um, I had a large number of people watching a V1 church online every Sunday in Northwest Indiana, partly because I pastored a pretty significant church there as the exec pastor, partly because I was born and raised there my entire life. There was many factors converging to how many people were watching, but I got asked by my apostolic oversight to try to heal the church that I was sent from in a time of a lot of turmoil. I won't even get into it. And I was surging online, 2,000 viewers every live stream, all this stuff. So I'm now all these people are finding out Mike's in Northwest Indiana again. And I sort of was like growing this guy's church while I was trying to heal it. Well, he didn't submit to the totality of the process that we laid out as apostolic leaders. And I decided to give everything back and walk away from it, go back to New York. And I told all those people, just go find another church in Northwest Indiana that you, that you think... Uh, is similar or that, that the Holy Spirit's leading to you. Well, what I did unintentionally was hundreds and hundreds of people started watching V1 church and left that church. So then I started a process of saying, okay, well, I didn't do nothing wrong. So we'll just make a campus out of it. Well, my apostolic leadership got a hold of me and they said, Mike, hold on. We don't want this to be perceived as a church split, even though it's not. So we're asking you to not do it. Jeremiah, people don't know these backstories though, but I'm using it to illustrate yeah. what you said. I got all these people together on Zoom. I said, I don't want your tithe and offering. I don't care about your gifts and talents. I don't care. I don't want nothing from you. My apostolic oversight said, shut it down. I don't believe we did it with the wrong intention. I don't even think it was the wrong move, but I respect and honor their voice in my life. And you, I'm, I'm forbidding you guys to even make a campus of V1 Church. And people were crying. I'm like, you, I can't stop you from watching the sermon online, but we're not going to make a church. Okay. A month later, my apostolic oversight gets a hold of me and they say, you know what, Mike, we were praying about it 
and we actually felt like we told you the wrong thing. <laughs> this, this is, and they wow. said, they said, because you didn't do anything wrong. The people didn't do anything wrong. We were concerned about the perception, but at the same time, these people need to be shepherded and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they said, if you want to proceed with it, get back. I got everybody back in the zoom and I said, okay, guys, it was a red light. The red light just turned green and we're going to do it. Within one year, Jeremiah, that campus, we bought a building, flipped the wow. building, two auditoriums filled, adding staff members, all kinds of fruit. But if you were to ask me, how did it happen? It was because even though as the lead pastor, I have total freedom for governance, I listen to the voice of apostolic leaders, even when I disagree. So some of the favor that I carry on my life is the favor that flows from how I receive a, a rebuke, I don't even understand or agree, but I see the fruit of the life of the person who's doing the rebuking and doing the correction. And I say, you know what? I would be wise to listen to them. So yeah. that's just an example of I'm not under my apostolic oversight. They're lateral to me, but I'm wise to say, you know what? They see something, I'm going to respond to it. So I know that was a mouthful, but what do you, I mean, does that kind of illustrate yeah. like the point where like, I, it wouldn't have been sin, I guess to drive it home, to kick it back to you. It wouldn't have been sin for me to make the Indiana campus, but it was wisdom to do it. You know what I mean? And so it's like, even in a matter like that, there's such a grace that flows in my life to be like, you know what? I don't even get it. I don't even really agree, but I'm submitting. In the, and I think when I look at Jane, and if I was, if I had the privilege to pat, to talk to Lindell, I would tell him the same thing. I, I, to his face, you know, I would say, Hey, what would it have looked like if you didn't understand it? You didn't even agree with it, but you surrendered to his correction in that moment. What I'm advocating for is we have got to recognize in friendship and in team when God is clearly speaking to someone that we know and giving them an opportunity to rebuke the spirit, the principality, call for repentance. I mean, there could have been, and, and again, we all miss it. You know, I mean, I know like everybody wants to, you know, hang John Lindell and he's a hair. I, I don't believe John Lindell's a heretic. Right. I believe he loves Jesus. I believe that he's a great pastor doing the best that he could. And he missed it in that moment. It, it's okay. And that's what you're saying. It's yes. like the internet is the peanut gallery. Most yeah. people, they've never led anything. They've never built anything. So we're just, you know, shooting the whatever. I mean, and again, John Lindell did not hire the stripper, like someone on his staff, like, like you, you, again, people don't understand leadership. Okay. Someone on his staff erred in judgment, did not look into the history of that right. uh, entertainer who was there. And again, I think that they just simply missed the moment as a friendship and as a yes. team for Mark to call that, that sin out and bring forth repentance. They missed it. He, he, you know, he walked off and they came back out. But again, I don't think them coming back out on the stage was like, see, it's all good. I'm like, no, they came out on the stage and did the best that they could. But the spirit of Elijah was not fully released into that atmosphere to bear forth the fruit of repentance. And again, it's something we can all learn from. I think, Mike, the last thing that I would say is it's not about Mark Driscoll. It's not about John Lindell. It's not about Alex. Like people are, I, I want to just say prophetically, it's a distraction. People are becoming distracted by the key players in the storyline. Yeah. And we're missing the storyline. This is about God saying to people watching today, this is about God inviting those of us to say, you know what? Sometimes you've got to learn from mistakes. You've got to learn from, but let's learn the lit lesson. Like let's respond with solutions, not getting caught up in the drama. Yes. Well, and I think there's some people that think that me and you talking about this right now is clickbait. 
or that me and you are trying to grow a YouTube channel. It's like me and you are doing some of the largest spirit filled events in this nation. And we see things and we have an obligation to teach and educate and, and develop the body of Christ. And I think that's what you're doing. I think that's what I'm doing. It's like, you, just like you said, it's not about Mark Driscoll. It's not about Lindell. It's about an interaction that happened and what that represents and symbolizes for the body of Christ. And I do want to say this. You you guys all know here I'm friends with Mark. I'm sure he's watching some of this and other things that I've posted. You know, I, one of the reasons why I made the video I made yesterday was because I felt like when he came back out on stage, like there was almost like this lid put on that that Elijah mantle, there was like this li limitation. It's like, because for me, and I, maybe this, because I have a whole nother level of stubbornness and obstinance. It's like, I don't know that I would have backed down off of it. And, and I say that because going a step further than Mark, I honor Mark's contribution. He wrote the book. He's in the movie next week. You know, theaters are going to be filled with uh, come out in Jesus name and Domino revival. He's in Domino revival, but I also, cast out demons like all the time. And I know that Mark's cast out many demons. And, and I remember him even doing that back in the Mars Hill day. But my point in saying that is when you understand the implications of how many men were in that environment, some, and a percentage of those men deal with same sex attraction. And you got a guy, and I know this because I pastor a large multi-site national church. So now you have some guys where they're, they're enticed by that. They're aroused by that. Then you talk about a ceremonial aspect of it. I mean, you know, I let me just tell you guys how it feels to me. To me, it feels like if uh, if to me that opener might as well have been uh, a new ager coming in, making a pentagram with salt on my stage before a worship set and doing an incantation. That's how it feels to me. And I and I think, but when he confronted Jezebel. There was an opportunity for people to get free. And I feel like for me, what was most heartbreaking in that whole equation was when there when there isn't a moment. And I think what what Mark was trying to do is create a moment of, of repentance, but re repentance always precedes freedom. And so I think also it's an indictment on a lot of these events that are centered around learning, but not centered around freedom. And it's because I think we're a very knowledge-based obsession. You know what I mean? So it's like, we want to hear from Mark. We want to hear from this speaker. We want to hear from that speaker. Well, one of the most powerful, if not most powerful things Mark was going to do is called impartation, meaning, hey, you might not remember everything that was said, but you'll remember a grown man getting down on a knee and repenting for Jezebel and not tolerating it. You know, just, yeah. just like, and I'm going to kick it back to you, but just like, at my marriage conference, I've been doing marriage conference for years and years. And I come up there with all my best, best illustrations, all my best one-liners and, you know, people learn from it. It's great. But this last year I said, you know what, forget all that. People remember what they see, but they don't always remember what they hear. And so there was a big moment, in our marriage conference where I walked over to Julie and I said, you guys want to see the one position and I kind of made it, you know, I, you know, this, this position will change your marriage. And all the sickos are like, yeah, let's see it. You know? And I said, I'm going to show you, you men a, a position that many of you don't know. And I walked over to my wife and I put my hand on her head and started praying for her. The whole room got wrecked. And I said, you, you know, every position, cause you have a pornographic brain, but you've never led, you've never put no your more. hand on your wife's head and prayed for her and interceded for her and all that. And the whole room got wrecked. But my wow. point in saying it is, there's an impartation from my life when you do as I do. And, and I think that my, and my, <laughs> not that it matters if I'm going to shout from the peanut gallery from my cell phone, my rebuke to, to Driscoll and Lindell would have been, we've seen the sit downs at the table between brothers. We've seen the speaker talking from a stage. What we haven't seen is when Mark Driscoll got down on his knee and was getting ready to, to lead an entire conference through repentance for tolerating Jezebel. Give me that moment back. Come on. We, we have we have the um, what are those things called panels? We have the panels. We have the sessions. What we don't have is repentance and rebuke. And that was what God wanted to do. And 
maybe well, maybe at the V1 men's conference, we'll get down on a knee and we'll all repent for uh, tolerating Jezebel and finish what God was trying to start. So we'll, I, I'm, what do you say to that? <laughs> yeah, man, I, I'm with you. Yeah, I, I again, I just I think some people are trying to use them coming back out on stage of it was all good. And it was I just think that was a PR smoothing things over, try, you know, trying to do the best that you can in the moment. But I do not believe that that is what God was after in that moment. I believe God was trying to model. Yeah. This is how real friendship works. Yeah. An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Come on. I think God was trying to demonstrate to the, and, and even again, conferences, guys. I mean, you, you, we don't, you know, there's conferences that happen all over the nation. When's the last time a conference speaker yeah. got up and said, you know what? There's an evil spirit operating here. We need to repent. I was sent today uh, a, a chapter from David Wilkerson's book, The Vision, in 1973. And in 1973, he wrote about nude dancing in church. And I was thinking about this individual that they hired that, you know, ripped his shirt off and, you know, the pole and just all of it. And I thought to myself, I wonder if David Wilkerson was peering down 31 years later. So here's what he said. This is Wilkerson. Nude dancing in certain churches will be excused as artistic forms of worship. Men will become worshipers of the creature more than the creator. And God will be forced to give these kinds of worshipers over to their uh, sins. As a result, many will be given over to repre reprobate minds, creating a new form of mental illness that will not respond to any kind of treatment. Mm. Public nudity in any form is creature worship. Nudity in the church will not go unanswered by God. The Bible clearly states that this form of worship inevitably leads to severe mental problems. And so I know that you and I love Wilkerson, a, a yeah. true voice, a true prophet. But I just I, I've talked to people that were there and said that when this dude, you know, ripped his shirt off like there was a, a spirit, an unclean spirit that that was released in the room. And I, I think that Wilkerson is sounding the alarm that much more of this. And, you know, Mike, it's funny when you talk about this, people have all sorts of justification and oh, what's the problem, whatever. And yeah. I'm like, dude, I don't I'm not interested in watching any dude rip off his shirt and do anything with with a pole or swallow a sword or like that ain't normal. That ain't necessary. And let's just stop it. Excusing at least weirdness. But there, there's definitely something going on. But I think Wilkerson's up to something there in his, his book, The Vision from 1973. Yeah, thank you for getting that on the record, guys. I know Jeremiah's been with us for quite a while. I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap up here because this has been so rich. But if I could add anything in closing, what I've noticed is that when everybody starts taking the posture of the one giving the correction, they, then you actually have a body of Christ that never receives it. And right now we have to be very, very careful because what I'm seeing in the earth is um, a lot of believers, and a lot of this is being popularized by the internet, are, are um, how to inappropriately taking the burden of correcting the body of Christ, correcting leadership, whatever. But then the solution is, is not, oh, there's no correction. There's no rebuke. The solution is governmental authorities, people who have fruit that remains, John chapter 15, people that, you know, builders, those that, those who have built over time, you know, you'll know them. And Mark Driscoll represents one of those people who stood up. And I think that's, and, and again, it's almost like prophetically, Lindell represents the lead pastor that had a good idea that wasn't God's idea. Mm -hmm. And he lives in a vacuum where you can just quote Matthew 18 and that, and, and that dismisses 
even the, the, the legitimate correction, the legitimate rebuke. And I have to be very careful of this myself because I live in that world where I could just do whatever I think is the right thing to do with B1. And I gave you guys a story in this broadcast about how my apostolic oversight rebuked me and I shut a whole thing down. Um, but my point in saying that is, it's like, we, I think we're entering a dangerous period. And if I could just like put a part two to David Wilkerson's message, the part two to David Wilkerson's message would be the mental illness is here. Like that's the cold chill down my spine is he talks about when you see this, this will happen. Well, yeah. we saw it. It, there was an attempt to correct it. I felt like they backed down off of that correction. And the, the only natural consequence is it's here. Yes. And that mental illness is we worship the creation, not the creator. But then I think another hallmark of that mental illness is um, we're all the correct. We're all the rebuker, but not the rebuked. We're all the ones bringing correction yet never being corrected. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we need to, to pray for Mark Driscoll. Pray for John Lindell. Pray for yes. this brother that did the. And we need to, again, search inwardly when people fall, when people make mistakes, you know, spend, you know, go, 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 to, go yeah. examine yourself, go examine your own heart, your own motives. Again, it's like, it's, you know, Mike, you know, just in closing, is like, how many people got upset about that but watch pornography? The watch rated R movies. I mean, you're you're upset that that happened, but you clearly aren't don't have enough fear of God for your own life to repent of what you need to repent from. So let's just pray for these guys. But let's see, there's something bigger unfolding, and then let let's let's move forward. Let's make changes. Let's go from glory to glory, faith to faith. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Thanks for uh, just you know. Let's keep doing these. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I loved I loved the wisdom that you brought to this. The fact that you're echoing Wilkerson in this time. You know, as you guys know, some of you do don't or some of you don't. I mean, Wilkerson was kind of ostracized. In a lot of ways, he's been he's almost been respected and honored more after his death. And, you know, if you study his life, I mean, he was kind of like the odd man out. Um, for that reason, I'm very thankful for you. I mean, me and you kind of <laughs> have, have found comfort in that there are these voices in the wilderness and, um, you know, that it's the, the burden. But again, um, I would rather err on the side of it. I mean, even while we were talking, and I'll end on this, I kept having these thoughts in my mind like, you know, our goal is to gather 10,000 people at the Breakers Conference October 26th. Like, and I kept having these visions while you were talking, thinking like, do I have the courage to call all 10,000 people to repent for tolerating Jezebel? Come on. You know, like, 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 do I have the courage to come into an environment like that and say, we've done this whole conference. We spent, you know, all this money. We, people have flown all around the world and instead of tantalizing and stimulating and entertaining, bring a moment of sobriety. Where it's like we are, we're definitely not going to be that church that tolerates Jezebel, and I think it takes courage. So yeah, we pray for Lindell, we pray for Mark Driscoll, but don't get it flipped. Like it's what this situation represents. So Jeremiah, I can't wait to hear you at the Breakers Conference, um, guys. Real quick, like action you can take if you're like, what can I do right now aside from praying? I do know uh, Domino Revival, Come Out in Jesus' Name, is going to be in theaters next week in America. Please see it. Bring your friends. Yeah. But then also, if, you, or if you're not planning on going to the Breakers Conference, you know, Jeremiah was with me in New York City when we did an official mayor's office approved event. And, and it was a prophetic declaration. And go back and watch that footage here on my YouTube channel. But now we're going to be joining forces again for the Breakers Conference. A lot of you guys are hearing me talk about it, but you haven't got your plane ticket. You have got your ticket. I do believe that what God uses Jeremiah to speak at the Breakers Conference ha will have historic significance. There's going to be words that are being released. And, you know, last thing I'll say is, it's like uh, this. I know we go live all the time, but sometimes you have to be in the room. So if yeah. you're not making plans be, to be there, be there. So yeah. can't wait to be with you, man. I think it's going to be historic. Awesome. All right, my friend. Well, thanks so much for your time. 
uh, yeah, we stepped in it today. May Christ be glorified and the church be uh, strengthened by what we did today. And we pray, guys, that, that this called you to a higher level of maturity in the faith. Love you guys.